Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, until, until these people get the photo and video, video ready, I think we'll just start uh, interacting with each other. I think Sir was a little too kind in his introduction. I never was an outstanding student like uh, I mean, I, I was an outstanding student more of, uh, kind of like how, how he was. I spent most of my time, time outside class as well, not out of choice though. I was sent outside class uh, most times. Um, I, I was uh, average at best. I was never a good student. During college, I had uh, 13 arrears during my final year. And uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> so we were from the same college, so I think um, he'll be able to understand better. There's this place called uh, Babu Kadai outside, uh, outside the college. So we, used to, we weren't allowed to go outside the gate, so we used to jump the wall and then spend a the time there. So we could escape from the eyes of the professors. And uh, in the process, I, I earned 13 years in the process. So what happened was I was always particular about joining the civil services, the IPS in particular. So um, I, I took the exam uh, during my final year, and I, I got through the prelims. But uh, when the results of the prelims were declared, I had an arrear. Mains, I, I qualified for the mains, but I didn't have a degree with me. Um, so I wrote a letter to the UPSC saying, um, my results are not out yet, because I'd applied for re-evaluation. And uh, I hoped that I'd, that I'd be allowed to take the exam. And they were kind enough to agree. They said, um, you submit a provisional certificate until then, and then you can take the exam in the meantime. I, I, I got through the uh, uh, exam in re-evaluation, but uh, I, I didn't make it uh, through the mains that year. This, is, this was in uh, 2012. And, uh, I've seen three patterns of the examination. I started uh, prepare, preparing in 2011, and uh, during my first attempt, we had to take two optional subjects. So I had sociology and public administration. And with sociology and public administration, my general studies was always pretty strong, but I wasn't really confident about uh, uh, the option subjects. Um, so in 2012, um, I, I, uh, exams used to be scored out of 300 marks then, option subjects. So um, with public administration, I scored um, 42 out of 300. And I came back to Chennai, and I was talking to one of my friends, saying um, I, I thought I did really well. But are you comfortable with English, or should I shift to Tamil or, or Hindi? English. So, um, so I, was, I was talking with him, saying um, I thought I'd done really well. I don't know what went wrong. I was really confident. But then I ended up scoring just 42 out of 300. And he was consoling me, saying, you're still uh, far better off. I scored just 9 out of 300. So that's, that's how papers used to be scored then. But I, I don't think it reflects the amount of hard work that you put in. And how much you studied actually doesn't matter at all. It all ultimately comes down to um, how much you're able to present on the given day. Um, Yuvraj here and Devnath, your faculty is here. We used to study together. Uh, Devnath taught me. So you're in good hands. Uh, <laughs> Yuvraj used to wake me up for studying. I, um, I'm, I'm a late sleeper. I, I usually go to bed at 4 in the morning. I don't wake up until 12 or 1. He used to, be, uh, he used to go to the library at 6 in the morning. And uh, by the time he used to be up, he would already put in about 7, 8 hours of studying. Um, my, my general schedule used to be something like this. I used to go to sleep at uh, around 4 in the morning. And then I'd wake up at 12 or 1. I, um, I, I never liked studying, actually. So I used to have to force myself to study. Um, so these people would kind of motivate me, not, not, not in person, but, uh, I, but I, I'd be a little afraid thinking that these people would be able to make it and maybe I wouldn't. So um, I, I, I tried to make up as much time as I could. So eventually after, after we went to the uh, library, I, I uh, used to watch videos on YouTube for about an hour and a half or two. And then, uh, <laughs> so, so after that, um, there was another friend, friend of ours. He's working for Amazon right now. And uh, he used to take me along to have some Pani Puri because I still wasn't able to study. And then I'd come back and then start studying. I'd spend about three hours, four hours studying. And then I'd go back to my room. And uh, at the end of the day, these people, we used to take exams together. And the <laughs> Yuvraj was always very strong with the prelim preliminary examination. He used to score uh, above 100, 110 all the time. And I found it hard to score above 80. And uh, I was wondering if I really would be able to make it or if I had any chance at all. Um, so I thought, um, um, I mean, I know I can't study anymore. 
Um, so I thought I'd maybe start looking at previous year's question papers, and that's when um, they have not discovered this thing called technique, I think. I'm sure he's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's teaching you these days. Um, he helped me with that, and uh, that sort of gave me some confidence. Um, eventually, during the prelims, I think I, I ended up scoring more than um, uh, Yuvraj or Devnath did. <laughs> and then um, I, I used to stay here, and Yuvraj was in Delhi then, and um, he was sure that I wouldn't make it if I was studying from here, so he said, go with me to Delhi. I went there and stayed with him, and I started preparing for the general studies, and I was pretty confident with that. I'd switched options. I'd switched optionals four times during the process of my uh, studying. I'd taken the exams six times in a row. 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 when I made it. Um, so initially I had public administration and sociology, and then um, it didn't seem to work. So I thought I'd just stick with sociology because we had just one option then. And after that, uh, sociology wasn't scoring as well, at least as far as I was concerned. And then uh, a few of my friends made it from sociology that year, so I thought sociology was a good option. So I switched to sociology. <laughs> and then the year that I took up sociology, a lot of my friends from anthropology made it. So, <laughs> so I thought going to anthropology would do better. I switched to anthropology the next year, and I didn't make it again. I, uh, there were a few of my friends in the border security force who said, uh, I think you should go with your regional literature, and uh, that would help you, um, see you through. Um, I was a little doubtful, but then I thought, I don't have anything to lose. I haven't been making it anywhere for five years in a row. So, so I, I switched to Tamil literature then. Um, I, hadn't, I, I studied in CBSE school, so we, hadn't, uh, we didn't need to study uh, language after 10th grade. So it had been almost uh, 12, 13 years since I'd actually written Tamil. The only thing that I used to write was the qualifying paper in the mains every year. Um, so with Tamil, what happened was uh, I, I kind of managed to study, but then uh, reading, uh, writing was a little difficult. I was okay with paper two, but I wasn't confident with paper one at all. And then Devnath came to Delhi from Chennai just to teach me Tamil. <laughs> no, he he qualified as well, so he thought he'd be able to make it that year. So he came along, and both of us started studying. He he taught me Tamil. He made notes for me. Um, I I studied from his notes. Um, I scored 273. He scored 180. <laughs> so <laughs> so and after that, I mean, th this was my uh, fourth optional subject and sixth attempt. So. Um, so then, then, then we made it, and then Yuvra has been taking the mains for two years in a row after that as well. I'm hoping he makes it this year. Um, Israel, sir, was telling, oh, that's, those are pictures of me. That was, uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, my father was in the police service as well. He's a 1987 batch IPS officer. So growing up, I've always wanted to be my father. I've looked up to him. I still do look up to him. And uh, those are pictures from when I was smaller than the rifle. And the one in the middle is when I was course at NPA. So um, Israel sir asked me to tell you about how things are at NPA. So if, if you want to know anything else that I, that I failed to cover, please feel free to stop me in between and ask. Um, I don't want this to be a monologue. I remember sitting on that side and I'd be like, uh, I hope this guy shuts up fast. So if you feel that way, please let me know. Um, so what happens is, you know, um, how, you know how the exam works, obviously. So after the exam, uh, we have a three-month foundation course. Um, and then where people from all services come through. And then you interact with them for three months and then you move on to NPA. At NPA, the training is majorly divided into two sections. One is the indoor section and another is the outdoor section. The outdoor section is what mo most people are afraid of. Um, indoor section wise, I mean, you, in, in indoors you're taught, you're taught uh, the Indian Evidence Act, the Indian Penal Code, the Criminal Procedure Code, special laws, criminology, local laws, policing in modern India, maintenance of peace and public order, forensic science, forensic medicine, um, call data analysis, information communication, use of that to hack phones, how to recover data from um, uh, seized mobile phones, seized laptops, electronic devices. So that, that's the kind of stuff that you get to see in, in uh, James Bond movies, only it's less interesting. It's not as interesting when you're sitting in class. Um, and the NPA takes sleeping in class really seriously. Um, I, I, I found it really hard to sit up and listen to a lecture, so if you want to sleep, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Um, so what happened was um, I, I, I used to be a, um, a habitual sleeper. Um, as soon as I went to NPA, um, I mean, I couldn't help it. Yuvraj used to tease me for the mains, and he, I, I used to be able to listen for 10 minutes, and then I'd go to sleep. He'd wake me up and then teach me again. Um, so so I, I, I'd uh, have lasted at, at most 40, 40 minutes at most, I think. I, I, it would be hard for me to go longer than that. 
So at NPA, people take sleeping very seriously. Um, I, I went to NPA, I started sleeping in the first class. People noticed me, and then I was sent to, there's this place called Sentry Room uh, in the NPA where they send you for punishments. If you sleep in class, you're supposed to go stand in the sun and do sentry duty for two hours. I did that once, I did that twice, and then I got used to that. And <laughs> So, um, so they figured they'd have to do something else with me, and then um, they started deducting marks from the, there, there's this called, the thing called director's assessment, which ultimately adds to your uh, marks, and it will uh, impact your seniority in the long run. Because you, you join the NPA at a certain rank, and the amount of marks you score in NPA will uh, ultimately decide where you're placed amongst your batch in the list of seniority. Let's say there are 10 people, someone who does really well at NPA will end up moving to third position from seventh, so when your batch is being promoted, he'll be promoted third, and you'll have to wait until the turn for the seventh person comes. So that's how that assessment impacts the scores. And then once they decided that sentry duty wasn't working, they started deducting marks from director's assessment. And then uh, fortunately for me, there was no director then. And I also didn't know where the marks were being deducted from because I didn't remember scoring any marks in director's assessment until then. So I was pretty happy. And then after, after three or four months, a new director came over, and then he was like, yeah, all this director assessment nonsense is not working. Everyone will start afresh, and the new director, so no, uh, we will we'll start from zero, no one's losing anything. So I was lucky enough like that. And then after that, they started making me run around the campus because I was sleeping. So <laughs> and that, that eventually helped in improve, uh, improving my running skills. So it, it, it was uh, a win-win situation in, in, in every sense of the word. I, I couldn't complain much. So. That's what in, in indoor sessions, that's what you have. You have the penal code, the criminal procedure code, and all that. And I think you'll find the outdoor section more interesting because the indoor sections, I mean, people who've done law will be able to associate, I mean, relate with this. Or, or even people who, who have interest can, can just pick up a book and start reading. Um, in the outdoor section, what happens is, um, I'm a little, my memory is a little bad. I'll just pick up a piece of paper. No, I, I came here um, just like I went for my 10th board exam, completely un unprepared, so forgive me. Okay, so the outdoor session starts. See, initially, what happens is as soon as you enter the NPA, uh, there are about 150 of us. Uh, so what happens uh, when you enter NPA, there's this thing called zero week. This is what you want to know, or you want me to talk about something else? Because he told me that uh, you'd like to learn, listen about the training at NPA. So there's this thing called zero week where people from all shapes and sizes just walk into NPA because they've cleared an exam, not everyone's fit. And uh, so people, uh, they, they divide us into what's called squads. So each squad has approximately 20 people. So with 150 people, we have eight squads approximately. And uh, what happens is each squad is, tri is distributed evenly on the basis of uh, physical performance. People of all ha average height, I mean people, tall people, you'll find them in each squad. People, heavy people, you'll find in each squad. Fit people you'll find in each squad. Fast people you'll find in each squad. So you get the idea. They try to make people uh, make squads even so that um, um, when eventually we have to we have, the squads are made because you have to play inter squad games during the end of the course. So the squads are made in such a way that people don't complain. Okay. <laughs> I got that. So. Squads are actually divided, so you'll be able to compete with each other during the end of the um, um, course for, for various trophies. Uh, there are five compulsory games. You have to play uh, handball, football, volleyball, hockey, and uh, volleyball. These five game, games are compulsory. So they try to divide the squads in such a manner that um, every squad's at a level playing field as far as these games are concerned. So on the zero week, they test you based on how, how fast you're able to run, how many push-ups, sit-ups you're able to do, how many chin-ups you're able to do, how much distance you're able to cover in running, how, how high you can jump and all that. And they divide you into squads. And what happens after that is they start training you. There's two parts of training, training there in the uh, out, out, uh, outdoor section. One part concentrates on your cardio. The other part concentrates on your explosive strength and uh, uh, endurance training. So um, um, the cardio part mostly has to do with running. We start off running uh, 800 meters, and then we eventually build up to 5 kilometers, and then 8 kilometers, and then 12, and then 16, and then 25, and then 40 kilometers eventually. During the end of the course, every person has to complete a 40 kilometer route march with 15, kilometers, uh, 15 kgs of weight uh, in six hours um, to qualify. If, you do, if you're not able to qualify, you'll have to come back and do it again. 
So, I mean, if you want to stay in the IPS status, you can always decide to quit. Um, so, that's what cardio has to do with, and then, um, yeah, and, and then with uh, um, endurance training, they try to take us for swimming, they try to make us uh, uh, run long distances, and for strength training, the regular things, you, we have really state-of-the-art gym there, and most people don't find time to use it, but uh, the gym's really good. And uh, that's what strength training mostly has to, has to do with training in the gym and then pushing yourself here in the squad. I mean, they, you, every squad is assigned two people, they call instructors. And one instructor is of a constable uh, or, or head constable uh, uh, level. And then you'll have a sub-inspector or inspector rank officer who manages things. So this person is with you through, through training and he'll make sure that everyone um, is, is performing to the best of his or her ability. Um, so, and, and the outdoor training is, uh, it, it's mainly meant to develop your confidence to make sure that you're able to handle situations on the field, to make sure that you have confidence in your abilities. So, it'll always try to make you uncomfortable, to push you to your limits, to push you to the point where you're breaking. Um, so, it, it starts with running and then we move on to drill, but what, what you'll see in a little bit, where people march and salute and all that. And... Uh, we have equitation where you're taught horse riding because the instructors there think if you're able to control a horse, you'll be able to control a district. That's what they tell you when they're teaching horse riding. Uh, many people fall from the horse, they're dead against horse training, uh, horse riding. Um, what I, I'll tell you one incident that happened uh, during my uh, training here. Um, there was this friend of mine um, who doesn't know how to ride a horse at all. But the exam um, depends more on the horse's abilities than your own. You just sit on the horse and it takes you around the course. There are very few people who will be able to ride the horse themselves and then score well. So this guy he sat on the horse and then he, his, his fortune was good. He ended up scoring seven out of eight marks. And there was this rider from Nepal who used to ride horses really well. And he failed that exam. He scored three out of eight. You need to score 50% in every exam to qualify. And so um, the, he also scored more than another guy who was his buddy. So during another regular practice session, practice uh, session of ours, uh, this guy was riding behind his buddy, and this buddy's horse happened to kick this guy's horse by accident. I mean, not not out of choice. I don't know any of us know how to uh, control a horse enough to make it do that. But uh, it just happened to kick the other guy's horse, and he fell down. And uh, he 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 was, I mean, he was in pain. It was visible. But then people around him started laughing, saying. Um, <laughs> this this is not worthy of seven marks and all that. But uh, people, uh, the thing is, horses are unpredictable. It's it's uh, really hard to see someone who's co who confident on a horse not be confident on the field. It's hard to find people like that. So if you fall from a horse and you get up and then you start riding again, if you push yourself when you know you're in pain, and uh, that that builds character, and that's what the uh, idea of NPA is. So we have equitation and then uh, we have drill, like I just told you. And drill also includes what we call the riot control drill. Because in most areas, what happens is you have to deal with mobs and crowds who are unruly. So we have a set, a set pattern set uh, uh, of protocols that you have to follow to ensure that the uh, mob is dispersed with minimum use of force and with minimum uh, collateral damage. So to do that, you're taught a riot control drill through the year. And you have to, e everything that's there, is done with the aim of making you qualify a test. There's nothing that's optional. There's nothing that's taught just because you want to learn something. Everything that you have, if you, if you tie your shoelaces, you'll be marked based on that. So it, that's, that's how important every skill that I teach you there is. You won't realize its importance when you're there, but after you come, over, come outside and you see situations on the field, you understand that people actually did try to make something of you. And after right control drill, we have uh, firing. Firing, as far as in, um, firing is concerned, I think NPA is one of the most, uh, um, I mean, it spends a lot on each, each uh, officer trainee there. And the kind of exposure that they give you is uh, uh, unparalleled. I don't see any other academy in India which gives you so much exposure. Even the infrastructure there is state of art. Um, they, they start with making you fire .22 rifles, the kind of rifles that you see in the beach, only it uh, shoots further and it can kill people. So. It looks like that, and they start with the .22 rifle, and then they move on to the 303 rifle, and then we have the carbine rifle, the one with the holes in it, which you've seen in a lot of Tamil movies. And uh, after that, you have the um, AK-47, and then we have the MP-5, which is from Austria, and then we have the Beretta Storm that's uh, uh, fired. We have the SLR, the INSAS, the pistol, 
three types of pistol, Glock 17, 19, and the Browning auto pistol. And then they, they teach, us to, teach you to fire from revolvers. So uh, firing-wise, you fire from almost every weapon that's on the field. They make you fire rocket launchers, the kind that you see in movies, when you're taken to the BSF for attachments. So, and uh, after that, we have uh, swimming. Swimming is also compulsory. Every uh, officer trainee there has to be able to swim at least uh, 50 meters and then retrieve a floating object and come back. So that's with the idea of uh, mimicking um, your ability to save someone who's drowning. Um, and then uh, they have scuba diving modules there where they teach you how to scuba. It's just an introduction, but it, it does a good job at that. Um, and everyone's also taught um, first aid drill, so you know how to be a first responder in case uh, you have to deal with a situation where um, you have, I mean, you will be dealing with situations if you're in the IPS where you'll be uh, in a position where you'll impact people's lives. So if you're in a position where you're able to save someone's life, you won't be left wanting. You'll know what you have to do. So that's where the uh, first aid and ambulance tool comes in. And then we have what's uh, called the attachments. <clears throat> and the attachments is a, uh, a part of NPA training where they take you to another organization where you get to learn from their practices. And then you come back to the organization, come back to NPA and uh, move on with your regular training. So we have five or six attachments. We have about, we spend about three months of a training, approximately two and a half, three months of a training uh, with other organizations doing attachments. So we started off with the um, IB attachment. The IB stands for the Intelligence Bureau in Delhi. So we started off with that. They, they teach you the stuff that you see in James Bond movies and spy movies, but it's not as interesting at all. They teach you how to interrogate people, how to mount surveillance, how to uh, intercept phones, how to intercept call, um, um, emails, how to hack into someone's computer, how to recover data, and all that. It, it sounds interesting, but it's very boring when you're sitting in class, and uh, it, it's not as interesting at all. But it, it's useful, though, I must tell you, but it's uh, pretty boring. And then we follow that with the ITBP attachment. Uh, the ITBP is uh, short for the Indo-Tibetan Border Police. And those people are experts at uh, high altitude warfare and mountaineering. So they take you there and teach you how to uh, uh, rappel down mountains, how to climb mountains without support, how to use a rope to get up mountains, how to get someone who's injured up, uh, down from a height. And uh, there's this part of ITBP training which is called battle inoculation, where then there is an obstacle course, which is uh, an obstacle course is a set of obstacles which you have to negotiate in order to f get to the finish line. The battle inoculation course at ITBP uh, starts off, it's, it's cold, it's in Missouri, so it's cold already, so the water's freezing. And I mean, we were lucky enough to go there in June, I think, but the water was still cold. I'm from here, so uh, any, anything north of Maharashtra is still cold. Um, what happens is uh, they start off with this slush where mud and uh, water are, are like about knee deep, and you have to crawl through that. You can't walk through because there's barbed wire on top of you. Even if you were to look up a little, you'll end up getting your dress on. Or, and so you start with that, and then you, then you go, go through a tunnel that's about two, two feet uh, in diameter. So you have to push yourself through that, and then you jump through obstacles, and then there is, uh, and people are firing over you all the time. And people are, are sitting on the other side of you, they're firing uh, LMG, it's, it's called light machine gun. Light machine gun is for suppressing fire. They try to uh, imitate the conditions on a battlefield. So they're firing at you all the time, and you have bombs exploding on your sides, but you're supposed to keep going, and there's tear smoke that's coming. So you won't be able to breathe as uh, you would normally be able to. And there's regular smoke that's used for cover as well. So the idea is to put you under so much stress um, where you're still able to go back to, re to rely on your muscle memory to go and be able to negotiate things even when you're pushed to your limit. So that's what happens at ITBP. Then after that, you have what's called uh, the river rafting attachment. Uh, in the river rafting attachment, you, you just raft on it. It's obvious from the name. There's nothing much to say there. And th there's this interesting part of that uh, called the, uh, I mean, where you jump from a cliff. That's where you'll see the biggest guys of your uh, bats who, who look like, like, like they can eat mountains for breakfast, stand and, and, and start crying. It's, it's a 20-foot cliff where you have to, uh, from where you have to jump into the water. Um, from when you when you're standing below the cliff in in a mountain just in in a raft it just looks like it's really close by but then once you get to the top you do understand that 20 feet is quite something and li people literally started crying there was this guy um, uh, okay let, let's let's not go for his name but uh, so 
I mean, he he was a really good. Guy. I mean, he still is a good guy. He's a really good guy, and uh, he kind of looks like he's from Nepal. He's not from India. I mean, sorry, he's from India, but he looks like he's from Nepal. So when we were drafting, we were just telling our instructor about him, saying this guy is. But we just want to make a fool of the instructor, so we were saying this guy is from Nepal, and he's one of the most uh, naughtiest guys in the bats, and he doesn't let people sleep in peace. But uh, he he takes offense if people say he's not from India. So once we went to the top of the cliff, he was saying. Um, uh, the instructor started asking, "Ab, ab Nepal me kahan se ho?" So he said, uh, "Nahi nahi, sir, I'm from India." He said, "Nahi, aise koi dikkat nahi hai. I mean, I won't take offense. Ab, tell me where you're from." And then he was like, "No, no, sir, I'm in the IPS." And then <laughs> this guy leant leant forward to see how deep it was, and the instructor pushed him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he landed on his face in the water, and then uh, he he's not good with swimming as well. And then he need to be rescued and pulled back into the, into the boat. But those are memories that you'll carry with you for a lifetime. I, mean, I don't think you'll be you. <laughs> and then, and then he he came back to me. He he knew I was I was the person who was going around telling people that he was from Nepal. So he came back to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, th these are uh, kind of memories. I think it's it's, it's uh, moments like this that that uh, bond you together. And uh, I think that the physical aspect of training at NPA is what makes it uh, one of the best services. I'd say. The bonding that you develop with your batchmates is something um, that you won't be able to find in any, any other service at all. You can, you can meet people after 30 years, 25 years, and you'd still be able to talk to them like you just uh, were together yesterday. Um, and then after the uh, um, uh, this um, Rishikesh attachment, wherein we go for rafting, we have what's called the election attachment. Each person is sent to their uh, two states close to the carters for election attachments to see uh, how the Election Commission of India functions, how the model code of conduct functions. Um, uh, what the role of the police in uh, conducting elections is, how the collector, is able, the collector uh, takes care of elections, how the uh, subdivisional magistrate does uh, things for elections and all that. So it's, it's to familiarize you with the functioning of the election commission and uh, um, to, to just familiarize you about your role on the field. But uh, there are people, uh, there are batchmates of mine who've done really good work even during a chat I mean, You just go here as observers. People don't expect you to do anything. You just stand there and you observe the function so you're able to replicate it when your time comes. Uh, there was this friend of mine who was born on the Punjab quarter. He went to Punjab for the elections. And uh, he uh, is, is a little proactive. Um, so, I mean, he, he takes pride in being the service. So it's not like um, as soon as I'm back home, I'm, going, I'm back to my room, I'm, I'm going to um, let go and sleep. So he, he woke up at 2 in the morning, and then he said, let's, let's go patrol. And then when he went patrolling, um, he just happened to stop a vehicle by chance, and he, he recovered about uh, three, four lakhs in cash. And uh, this was at 3 in the morning, and, and he didn't have to do anything. It's, it's uh, people like this who take initiative who, who inspire you to do better. And this was despite him not needing to do anything. And this same guy, uh, during the elections, uh, was in a, in a community sensitive part of Punjab. So um, uh, people were about to uh, start um, writing against each other. And this was when, I think there were just five or seven people with him. But he took the initiative. He said, let's take a stand here. Let's stop these people from um, coming in contact with each other. And he was able to hold them off long enough for the reinforcements to arrive. And, and, and People like this inspire you. Incidents like this teach you how important policing is as a service. If, if riots were to happen, if he, if he weren't there that night, things would have maybe come to a standstill for a day or, or maybe for a day and a half until people were able to do, uh, I mean, take things into control. So that, that makes you understand what kind of a service you're in, what kind of uh, an impact you'll be able to create in society with the smallest of your actions. Um, and after, after the election attachment, we have what's called the uh, Bharat Darshan where you go around India, I'm pretty sure you must have heard of it. You have three or four loops in India. One is the southern loop, one is the western loop, one is the northeastern loop, and all that. It's a central loop. So you're not able to go to where you're from, your home state, and to where your card has been allotted. So apart from this, you can go pretty much anywhere. And you go around, you call on the governor, you call on um, the uh, director general of police there. You see how the police functions. You see uh, how the culture of the, culture of the state is. Culture of the state is. Um, I mean, this is what the book says, but you know what people do there. It, it's, it's, I mean, I, I can't say that here. My parents are here as well. So, <laughs> But it's, it's fun. Bharat Darshan is, uh, is one of the uh, best memories that I have of uh, the entire training here. Um, maybe when, maybe when, when I'm able to talk to you in person some other time, I'll tell you. But, uh, <laughs> and then the Bharat Darshan is followed by uh, the BSF attachment. BSF attachment takes place in Indore. 
uh, wait, the, it, it's with the CSWT. The CSWT stands for Central School of Weapons and Training. Yep. And uh, what happens is that you're, you're introduced to area weapons. Sir. Until then, what you're, you're dealing with is um, small arms. Small arms is when you're able to take out an individual with a weapon. That can be rifles or, or, or pistols or, or whatever, that sort of weapons. And then um, with, with CSWT, you're introduced to area weapons like mortars, wherein if a, um, a mortar explodes, it'll, let, let's say, cover about 10, 10 meters in area. So anyone within that uh, range will be dead. So it's called an area weapon. These in, um, other weapons are called small, small arms. So with uh, the CSWT, you, you're, you're introduced to uh, sniper rifles, to 81mm mortars, to 120mm mortars, to, to rocket launchers. And that, that's uh, the part of uh, training that goes on in, in, in the BSF there. And then we have the most dreaded part of training in NPA is uh, what we call the Greyhounds training. The Greyhounds is an anti-naxal force of Telangana. I mean, it was constituted by the Telangana government. It's one of the most successful anti-naxal forces in India. So we go with them. We stay in um, uh, the, the forest for a week. And it was there that we realized how much uh, important water was, how uh, much the comfort of a bed means, um, how much it means to take a shower. You just go in one set of uniform. You're supposed to stay there in the forest for one week. You'll be given one and a half, two liters of water each day. You're supposed to manage all of your needs within that. You cook your own food, you carry your own luggage, you set up your own camp, you stay uh, where you're told, you light your own fire, you make your own fire there. And when you're moving out of an area, you make sure that there's no trace of you being there, because if you leave traces of you being there, the next lights will eventually figure out that you've been there, and they'll follow your trail and then get to you. I mean, this was in a controlled environment, but even then, despite all that, it was very uh, strenuous. It was physically demanding, and it was also emotionally taxing too. And, and, and you carry out operations in between. You, give, you go, you lay a cordon, you, uh, you, you cordon an area, and then you send search parties to go and figure out. I mean, people are playing roles there, but still. Um, so you, you understand how the anti-naxal uh, teams, anti-naxal forces in India function. And uh, that was a really eye-opening experience. It, it, it taught us uh, um, uh, how, how much we've been spoiled for choices in, in, in the urban scenario. In, uh, um, in, in wherever we've been living, we, we, we slept on grass, we slept with snakes crawling on a snake. On, on, on we, I, I, uh, one of my friends was, was uh, screaming one night, I didn't understand what happened. I just woke up and ran next to him, and then he said, uh, I think a snake just crawled uh, over me. So um, I think people start, start screaming in their houses because they see lizards or cockroaches. <laughs> but uh, once you stay in the jungle and you realize what kind of life these people are leaving, uh, leading, um, I think it's, it's nothing. I think. Uh, the, the comfort that we, we are able to appreciate the comfort that we have uh, much better. I think the NPA shows you the best of both worlds. It, it, when, you, when it, they take you for attachment, they put you up in the best of hotels there. And, and you really do feel that you become something in life. And then uh, when, when you go back to the academy, you're sent to the Greyhounds, and then you uh, sleep, sleep on the ground, and then you realize what you ultimately are. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the best aspects of uh, training at NPA. It, it, it builds camaraderie, and at the same time, it makes you understand uh, um, the, the value of things that you've taken for granted. But it also, at the same, same time, pushes the limits. You, you're, you're doing things together. So, so even when you feel like giving up, you, you, you keep going for the person that's next to you. You, you are divided into buddy pairs. Everyone has to go with a buddy. And uh, so if you, if you if a buddy is sick, you take care of his, uh, him, you, you carry his luggage, you carry his rifle, and all that. So, so th that's how uh, Greyhound's training went. It was there for, uh, I mean, the training lasted for seven days, I think. The, the initial two days were, were meant for briefing about how operations would be and how uh, you'd be staying. And the next five days we spent in the jungle. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the Greyhounds attachment was followed by uh, the Delhi attachment. That, that's towards the end of uh, training. I think that's the last attachment that we have. It's one month long. And the, we spent two weeks in Delhi and then another two weeks uh, in Jammu and Kashmir or, or Chhattisgarh or the Northeast, depending on where the carter is. They'll send it to another place. So I went to Jammu and Kashmir for the Army and CRPF attachment. So there I learned uh, in, in, in what kind of uh, scenario uh, the Army functions. Um, what kind of scenario the CRPF functions, how much they handicap, how much uh, um, they're short on resources. But there you also learn why the army is the army. 
the they uh, this the the way that they host you, the way that they take care of you, the chivalry there, the uh, I think being a host is something that we need to learn from uh, from the army. That is, we went to this place called uh, Torna. It's an Uri sector. The movie where the uh, the place based on the movie. So, and and we went to this place called Torna. It's uh, about fourteen no twelve or fourteen thousand feet. I'm not sure, but above sea level, and uh, it's it's in a kind of valley where you sit. And then there are uh, five or seven peaks around you. So you have pa Pakistan is always on the dominating heights because we ceded, uh, because they occupied uh, Kashmir. And they're on top on dominating positions and we're below them. But we still, they're like, dominating is not something you do with weapons, it's something you do with the head. And we don't let Pakistanis peak, peak out of their uh, posts. So they're, they're really afraid to even go there. So that's the kind of morale that they have even when um, it's, that that place is is um, is out of access. It's out of uh, uh, logistic support for six months in a year because of snowfall. Last year they said they had 48 feet of snowfall, and despite that, um, there was this colonel who hosted us. Uh, he was sitting in. He he, he took us to the place where uh, the valley is. It's an amazing viewpoint. You you get to see mountains, snow-covered mountains all around. You also see little dots on top, which are Pakistani posts. You're in the firing range of those uh, um, posts, and then. The colonel um, makes us sit, sit there. He pulls a chair and offers, offers all of us a beer. He says, uh, "You, you. I mean, this is this is how life is lived. You have a drink here." But we were polite enough to decline and all that. But uh, the thing is, despite being in such challenging situations, despite being in such conditions, the amount of morale that they uh, show and the amount of resilience that they show is unparalleled. And that that made us appreciate the role of the army a lot. Because until then, we were thinking the army doesn't get to do much. I mean, we're not going to war ever again. Uh, they're just plain perks despite uh, not doing anything. But they really do uh, do sterling work there. And that's something that we got to appreciate um, during the Army attachment. And during the CRPF attachment, uh, we were in Srinagar, and we were uh, close to the place where the stone pelting happens. It's called Lal Chok. And uh, I, I'll tell you another interesting episode here. Um, I mean, this, this didn't happen when I was there, but uh, what happened was, uh, um, these, these people start pelting stones on, on people from the CRPF every Friday, right after their prayers are over in the mosque. Um, so uh, one, one fine day what happened was uh, the people from the CRPF hadn't apparently had lunch. But the people who pelt stones and the people from CRPF have kind of de developed that kind of a bonding that uh, one fine day this guy, a guy goes and says, uh, we haven't had lunch now, so uh, come back at four and then we'll start pelting stones. So they actually did go back, and then they came back, and then they spelted stones at four, and then they went back again. So the stone pelting is more kind of uh, more uh, more of a, a symbolic protest than of uh, hatred towards India. I think there are, there are, it's it's very contrasting to see places like that. You have broken glasses on the uh, roads, and then you have walls that say "Go back, India," on on one side, right opposite to that. And the army has done a really good job saying, I love my India. And the other one, no, the, both, both of them keep painting on top of each other every, every week. And that's also fun to watch. The army comes during the nights and paint nights and uh, spray paints them. These people, the, the people, Kashmiris come during the day and then uh, say, uh, paint, paint over it saying, go back India. But they're really efficient. The part that says India doesn't change. It's only the I love and go back that changes. So that, that was interesting with CRPF. We, we were taken around. Uh, I mean, the first thing that we thought when we landed in Srinagar was this place is really beautiful. But as soon as we got down uh, of the flight and we got out of the airport, all of us were handed a bulletproof vest and a bulletproof helmet. And they said, uh, even if you want to go use a restroom, you will not go outside without this. And then they herded us, us, us like they herd sheep into a bus, a bulletproof bus, obviously. And then uh, they closed the door and they took us straight to the camp there. They're, they're living under a lot of restrictions, but the morale that they show is still, uh, is again, inspiring. And that was something that we learned from the uh, CRPF attachment. And then that was followed by uh, um, attachments with various organizations in Delhi, like the uh, Central Bureau of Investigation, the, um, the, the RAW, the Research and Analysis Wing. It does exist. People, most people think it doesn't. Um, it does exist. The India's External Intelligence Agency. And then we had attachments with the National Technical Research Organization, with the Special Protection Group, which takes care of the uh, security of the Prime Minister, the National Security Guard. Um, and then uh, we had call-ons on the Prime Minister of India, on the President of India, 
on the Home Minister of India, on the Home Secretary of the Union. And so that's, that's kind of how uh, um, the two weeks that you spent in Delhi uh, goes about. You, you're free at around 6, 7 in the evening, and then you can go about doing what you want. So I think I think that's that's about um, uh, the outdoor part of training and the uh, at MPA, and this is phase one of training. After phase one of training, you go out uh, to your field to your respective cadres, and you spend six months there. Uh, it's called DPT. It's called district practical training, and then you go back to the academy for three months of phase two training, and then that's that's the time when you're taken uh, abroad to to study the policing system of uh, countries abroad. Um, people are taken to Israel or, or, or Singapore, Russia, or France, or wherever the government has an agreement with. And then after that, you come back, you do your passing out period, and you go back to your states as uh, assistant superintendent of police. I think that's that about some sub training at NPA. So if you have anything else that you'd like to ask me about, I'm here. Otherwise, I think you're free to leave. <laughs> yeah, do you have any questions? Do you want me to take any questions? or? All right, then, thank you. In case you're wondering, we have people from um, three other nations training with us. People in blue uniform are from uh, Maldives. The people from the darker blue uniform are from uh, are from Nepal, and the navy blue uniform are from Bhutan. So we have the agreements with three uh, nations for them to send the um, police uh, officers over for us to train them. And they take pride in, in training with us. The amount of exposure that they get here, they're really thankful for. Uh, I just that was just something I remembered after seeing uh, the parade. That's about it. Thank you very much. They have not just asked me to speak about what it means to serve for India. Um, I, I think it's ultimately about the satisfaction that you find in seeing seeing happiness in the, in, in, in the eyes of the person that you're serving, irrespective of, of um, where you're from. Um, see, um, the, the police is a service where you're able to make a difference. You, you, you'll be able to make difference in 15 minutes what, what the other uh, departments of uh, the state will will take 10 years to make. Uh, let's say you, you a person comes to you with a, a certain issue and you're able to sort it out at the uh, police station level. The police station is the functioning unit of the uh, police force it, uh, itself. And let's say you're not able to resolve that and he has to go to, go to the judicial system. The judicial system, you know, has such a, a huge pendency. It will take him 10 or 15 years. So you can save 15 years of a person's life in, in, in like, like, like what, half an hour of your time. and and. When you do that, I think the trust of the person in the system increases. And if you're able to do that consistently, I think he'll take pride in being an Indian. And if you see happiness in their, in their eyes, you take pride in being in, in, in the uniform. Because uh, um, the, the amount of mental satisfaction that you derive, I don't think there can be any uh, monetary value that can be attached to that. Um, I, I think that, that's that quite about some sums, uh, sums what it means to serve in uniform. Any other questions? I mean, do you have do you have any other questions? So this is a forum that you can make use of. Please do make use of. Are you considering joining the police service as well? How many of you want to join the police service? No, not for me. I mean, sincerely. Oh, that's 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 great. That's really great. And our batch is one of the uh, um, 
uh, batches in which we had the largest number of people opting for the police service. We had about, out of 150 officers, we had uh, 15 of us who opted, who were in the service by choice, and that's the highest number until then. People generally have, we generally have like three, four, three or four people who are in the IPS, despite uh, getting into the IAS. So, I mean, it, it's, it's heartening to see uh, uh, so many people wanting to join the police force. I think it's, it's important for people who have a pride for the uniform, who take, take passion in serving in the uniform, make it to the service. Because it's, it's, it's sad when you say, uh, see people who come train with you and then uh, they take the exam again and then say, uh, I always wanted to be in the IAS. I mean, if you always wanted to be there, you didn't have to waste the government resources, you didn't have to spend so much time there. I think if uh, you, you feel that way, it's, it's, uh, it's really heartening to see. And, and our, our batch is also uh, special. We, I, I come from the 71st RR. RR stands for regular recruits. The other um, uh, um, rec uh, mode of recruitment being people from the state services who promote it. So those people are from the state services, they are, and uh, they're called SPS, State Police Service, and RRs are people who are recruited by the UPSC. So, from this, in the 71st RR, we had about 29 uh, lady officers, and that was the that is the highest amount of lady officers we have have we've had until now. Um, and and I I, I hope um, the day is not far away when 50% of the badges uh, comprise of male officers and 50% of female officers. It's 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 a really good service in the sense that uh, the uh, there's a high level of gender gender parity. The same thing that a male officer trainee has to do, a female officer trainee also has to do to become an IPS officer. I do a 40-kilometer route march. A lady officer will also do a 40-kilometer route march. I run 16 kilometers. A lady will also have to run 16 kilometers. I run a mile to complete my... Uh, it's, we have what's called the PPT, the physical proficiency test, where you have to run a mile, and then you have to do push-ups, and then you have to do sit-ups, and then you have to do chin-ups, and then you have to jump. And then you have to climb a rope, and then there's a standard obstacle course which you have to get through. It consists of 10 obstacles, and then uh, there's 16 kilometer running. All this comprises of the PPT. So all that a guy does, all that a male officer trainee does, a female officer trainee will also have to do. They negotiate the same obstacles. They go through the same training regimen, indoor and outdoor, and 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 that that makes makes them more confident, makes us respect them more because they we we feel that they've earned their respect. And we feel that, uh, um, I mean, we, we take pride in serving with women officers like that who, who, are, uh, who, who represent the uniform in such glorious light. So I, 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 um, I'm really happy that so many uh, of you want to join the police service, and I, I hope a lot of lady officers join this, I mean, la lady uh, aspirants join the service as well. Um, uh, now that my father's here, I think, um, I mean, if uh, you'd like to listen, he, he, he'd be happy to share his experiences. He, he was uh, um, an 87 batch officer. He served in the CBI as an SP for five years. And then um, he, by his te during his tenure in Haryana, he uh, uh, earned the, uh, he was awarded the President's Prime Minister's Medal for life saving for, uh, there was this time wherein uh, there were really bad floods in Kethal in Haryana. And he, he went beyond the call of duty to save five people and he was awarded the Prime Minister's Life Saving Medal for that. He, he also spent a tenure in, in, in CBI here in, in Chennai and uh, five years in CASF. And then during superannuation, he was the uh, addition director general of police operations in Haryana. So if, if you'd like to listen, I, I can maybe have him over to share his experiences. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Like father, like father, like son, Sulwangalingala. அது போல நான் அந்த காலத்தில் ஒரு யா சி லைக் இம் ஆல்சோ ஐ ஆல்வேஸ் வாண்டட் டு பி ஏ போலீஸ் ஆஃபீஸர் ஐ நெவர்ஸ் இன் காலேஜ் ஐ யூஸ் டு கட் ஹேர் வெரி ஷார்ட் ஐ யூஸ் டு டூ லாட் ஆஃப் எக்ஸசைசஸ் and uh, walk like a policeman when i see a policeman standing on the road i used to watch him as though i am standing there and you know uh, because one day i want to, i was uh, like uh, uh, the revered uh, abdul kalam always uh, you know says uh, have a dream what do you want to become you will definitely become 
with the question of at least putting your hard work on your dedication will take you to uh, the heights i found the police service is the one of the noblest services existing in the world because the uh, like he said you know because uh, what uh, the court cannot do in 10 years time you can uh, do it in 10 uh, minutes if somebody needy people somebody come uh, somebody comes to you with a lot of uh, problems within no time you can solve it such a kind of service this kind of facility is not available anywhere in the uh, no 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 service will provide such uh, uh, you know weapon so police is one of the best services ever existing in the world so uh, this is uh, considered to be uh, you know colonial service which is definitely not it used to be but it is not uh, nowadays when the people you know uh, lot of politicization is uh, you know political interference is there and lot of uh, politician comes to you and then um, uh, ask you to do nasty things so many things so many people will say the police officer say that at least a lot of political interference is there but definitely not what do you want to become if you want to become a operate officer the space is there if you want to be a big corrupt officer the space is there what do you want to become that you have to decide the only thing is you have to sacrifice certain things you are not to sacrifice you have to forego certain things if you are a guy with the operate officer you know the people may not give you the the place of posting the district posting you may not get it very often but definitely you will get it when the crisis the crisis is there definitely because the right kind of officer is always required because i was uh, serving in the haryana and whenever i was tk where there was a crisis major crisis i was posted when the crisis was over definitely i was removed even then you know because you feel proud because i was the one of, uh, i was the only officer in haryana to be in the it list that time it was a terrorist infested uh, uh, area haryana punjab everywhere when i was the only officer in the it list and i was uh, the provided with a lot of uh, you know uh, the bullet proof vehicle and then uh, commandos and all see what uh, happens is when i received first time the threatening letter babar kalsa international sent me a letter you are uh, uh, you know uh, kalki ketki moliye neethu peranda molaiyile molache kaalan nee indira gandhi kondam rajiv gandhi kondam nee enna aalu ingra mari they but he sent me a letter in uh, uh, punjabi little bit i was taken aback and then tk when i have a force of 2000 men with me when i am not able to protect myself how i can protect the people then immediately tk i took a decision i fortified my residence and then uh, tk bullet for car uh, everything government provided me with uh, all these uh, facilities i went to uh, tk uh, whenever i receive information you believe me i used to be the first person to reach the spot even the, the nearest person used to be the sho he will never come out of it but even then from 50 v 55 kilometers away from the place of the incident i reached first with uh, my men uh, about uh, 20 30 people with commandos with all weaponries i reach and then i corner and fight with them this used to be the history tk when the uh, many incidences the people are the people say that uh, the politicians are very bad but uh, in my experience you know politicians are very good they are not uh, as bad as uh, uh, protest uh, the projected to be the officers are very bad they are very you know cunning and then the, the officers are very uh, revengeful in many incidences i can quote see uh, one day fine morning when i was sp sirsa the chief chief minister called me 
early in the morning about 6 o'clock. He called me and said, SP Sam, Namaskar, Namaskar sir. Uh, see, uh, there is somebody in ka, uh, the in ka garelu ka mamla hai. Some problem, a domestic problem. I will send you, you look after him. Okay, sir. When he, I received him and then inquired uh, him, I found that he killed his wife and buried uh, in his uh, farm house. Immediately, I asked my DSP to exhume the body and uh, get it post-mortem. By evening, uh, 5 o'clock, it was all over. I arrested all the people involved, five people involved in this case and put them behind bar. The evening, 6 o'clock, again, a uh, phone came from him. He asked me, I requested you to help him out. You arrested and put him behind the bars. I told him, sir, this, in this deceit, you have a very good name. And some people try to tarnish the name. As long as I am SP here, I will not let others to tarnish your name. He could not speak for a while. He kept it for a while and then he said, TK Raj Koro. TK Alu. He kept the phone. So, this is how, you know, because it is, the politicians are always reasonable. And I can quote many incidences uh, like this. See, and then the, by the next time, there was a conference, the Congress conference at uh, Surajkund, near Delhi in Haryana. And uh, there was a huge uh, conglomeration of uh, people and all leaders and the Prime Minister is going to come to the uh, venue. And then uh, uh, I was a uh, young uh, ASP then. I was in charge of uh, traffic. So the, there, were, uh, there are so many uh, the enclaves, VAP enclave, VVAP enclaves, and then uh, so many things. I was looking after the traffic uh, standing on the road. And all of a sudden, when I was uh, standing on the middle of the road, leading to the venue, and all of a sudden, uh, one uh, vehicle came with a lot of speed, as though he, it was going to hit me. I did not at least leave the ground, you know, because I was simply standing. Anyway, I was thinking that at least the vehicle has to stop. Stop the vehicle, then I asked them, TK, show me the path. We don't have a pass. We are MPs and ministers or something like that. I said, uh, if you have a pass, hmm, go beyond this. If you don't have the pass, TK, you go to this side. They were very adamant and argumentative. And I never have TK left the place. It was going on for at least 20, 30 minutes. They immediately TK, the chief minister came running from the venue. He came running. He did not talk to me. The same chief minister, what uh, I was talking to, came running and took, uh, you know, uh, took uh, passes from his pocket and gave it to them. And I left the place and the vehicle uh, left it. So this is how the politicians behave. They are very sensible than the officers. So yet another, uh, the newly, uh, some other chief minister, he was insisting me to transfer one, I transferred an inspector from one place to the police lines because he used to be corrupt. Then he requested me because he is hailing from my in-laws place. So therefore, TK, you uh, transfer him back to the place where he was there. I said, sir, it is not good, you know, because he is corrupt and he is a uh, third red fellow, if he is posted uh, back again, it will not send a good message. Then uh, uh, the, he was uh, sort of requesting, he was not compelling me. He was, uh, uh, then I was IG there, wrote the range. I told him that, sir, uh, the Kabi Kabi 
हमारा इज्जत का भी थोड़ा ख्याल रखो यू नो एपया और तरह में मर्याद ही नहीं कुछ पातेंगे सर सुने सो इमीडियटली सेट ठीक है आपकी मर्जी एना से नहीं चंज के अब विलेटर से दिस इज हव दीफ मिनिस्टर हू ओवर इट मे बी वेदर इज ए चीफ मिनिस्टर आर सीनियर पोलिटीशियन आर सीनियर मिनिस्टर हू ओवर इट इज ई फाउंड इम फाउंड दम वेरी रीसनबल एंड दम वेरी अमेनबल टू रीसन सो देर फोर सी इट आल डिपेंड्स हव यू वाट टू बी बिकम वाट यू वाट टू बिकम what kind of police are you want to be because this is an occasion because no the, 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 the 120 crore uh, population only few people 4000 5000 ips officers see you are already a privileged uh, people it is a god sent opportunity to serve the people like okay. people choose to at least do many things because there are a lot of chances uh, for and is doing all uh, kind of activities you can earn money you can do so many things but ultimately what comes to you know because ultimately is whether it is okay, the question of satisfaction are you satisfied in servicing the people serving the people if you serve the people theek okay, hai nothing like that because uh, hundreds of crores of given uh, but, okay, uh, to you definitely that will not give uh, that much of uh, satisfaction if you really sincerely serve the people that is like uh, anything you know when i go to the i go into the crowd people come and is uh, running to see me alone i was like a hero in the uh, haryana i i was in sirsa because people uh, used to adore me like anything when i came out of the car you know just come out of the car people come running at least to the 200 300 people to see me alone so that kind of you know because satisfaction no service will give you the instantaneous justice you can provide the instantaneous instantaneous recognition also you will get it so you are take a very obvious in the crowd you are very much recognized because you are in the uniform always the people give you whatever service you render because uh, more than at least uh, 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 double triple uh, 10 times more the reward also comes back very quickly then you feel very proud you are one among the the, the one of the, the many chosen people so what i always feel is that you know because i never do any wrong thing i never let others also do any wrong things because many people are very upright they do the service better than at least me but what makes the difference is that i will not do wrong thing but i will not let others also so uh, many upright people theek okay, whatever happens let it happen if there is no point in at least uh, coming into the service when you are really want to do the service to the people mankind definitely definitely this is a platform this is the wonderful service you can do it so thank you very much i have been asked to wind up ha so you will not regret definitely i tell you many things see in my experience i had a very good experiences whether it is chief minister or whether it is a police uh, the chief the dgp i fought with them fought with them for the cause i was think uh, i was transferred out of the district people held a demonstration for 3 days people closed the doors closed the uh, the uh, shops for 2 days so i was uh, immediately transferred out of uh, i was posted as a sp trophy it was because uh, the many politicians uh, the it was the pressure because i used to address all the problems of the people the people don't go to the politicians so though they feel you know a little bit of uh, uh, threatened 
So when I went out of uh, the uh, uh, the SPC, I was still staying in uh, Sirsa district. After one month or so, I got an information that the terrorists were uh, camping there. Even though I was not SP, I took permission long back from uh, the DGP. Whenever I get information, definitely I will go to handle them. He said, take care of your security. It's not necessary. Even then, if he decides to go, decide to go, definitely take, take care of your security. I said, take care, sir. I went. I fought with them. There was an uh, encounter. And uh, we killed three terrorists. And um, when I returned to my house the next day morning, the IG range came. He called me. I went there, asked all the officers to get out of the guest house, and he uh, locked it from inside. He told me, what do you think of yourself? Do you think you are a KPS Gill of uh, Haryana? I was taken aback. He kept on shouting. In what capacity you went? There has to be one uh, line uh, in a jungle. There cannot be two lines. There cannot be two SPs in the district. When the district SP is there, how come at least you took the situation? I said, as a common man, as a citizen of the country, I went. As a police officer, I went. Because any, uh, poli uh, any cognizable offense takes place, if it is in the knowledge of the police officer, it is his duty to go. As a police officer, I went. And uh, DK, there was a bad duel. He shouted at me. I shouted back, him, back at him. And there was a huge, uh, then I uh, uh, told him that, uh, bloody fool, keep quiet. He shouted uh, at him and then uh, my IG, I uh, shouted him down, said him, uh, bloody fool, keep quiet. I will kick you. This was my, because I, uh, taking uh, such a risk of my life, I went and at least eliminated. Instead of appreciating, he started uh, pulling me down. So, because what I thought, uh, you know, what I am always thinking is, because if you, uh, you are on the right side, Nobody can fight against you. Nobody can cause any damage against you. Even God cannot fight against you. This is what I had, you know, because I have a very strong belief in myself. In one of the temples where I was asked to inaugurate, Kumbha Visegum, I went. The people were talking, the people were donating so much of money. One person came and donated 15 lakh rupees. One, you know, liquor shop owner. <laughs> Then yet another person came, he donated 10 lakh rupees to build the temple. Then my turn came, I told him that at least God is not that much weak to at least build the temple from the blood soaked money. Return the money back. If only you return, I will talk. Otherwise, I will leave. So immediately, the money was returned. Then only I think I spoke. So that was the, the, you know, the conviction. If you are on the right side, definitely right things always happen. Nobody can prevent and nobody can stop you. I shouted at my DGP but on some occasion, but he also shouted at me. But ultimately, we, we think he apologizes. So be on the right side. Do uh, take, uh, good things to the people, uphold the law. That's what at least ultimately give you a lot of satisfaction. Nothing more. And, uh, service, any service is good service. If a police service gives you uh, some platform to quickly take, uh, solve the problems, other services will give you yet another opportunity. IAS is equally good. It will give you some other opportunity. You can make policies for the country. So no, nothing is, uh, all are equally good, but uh, whatever service you want to be, whatever service you want to become, definitely 
do service to the people and uh, be happy. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. So thank you, Vijay, for coming and gracing the occasion. And thank you, sir, for sharing few words. In fact, I forgot to. You're clapping for whom, sir, or me, or him? In fact, in fact, I forgot to mention about sir. Okay, I was too much preoccupied with Vijay. Okay, sir is quite popular. I'm not just telling. You know, he's retired now, so I should not just like that tell any lie here. Outstanding officer, Haryana cadre. So his photos are bought and kept there. Okay, in every household very popular officer in Haryana, okay, very, very popular and a common man still, okay, they all remember, I have my batchmates there, now they all feel jealous of him, proud of him, okay, such an outstanding officer and it was a pleasure to have sir also here and thank you sir for coming here and thank you Vijay for gracing the occasion and his brother, <laughs> His brother is also an officer who is an assistant commandant who will soon become an IPS officer. Now also he is serving the country as a border secure in BSF. Cobra. Who he has got into CR? Cobra. Cobra is the elite commando force. So he has got selected there. So it is another bureaucrat in waiting his sister. Okay. Thank you.